Hello and welcome to today's session. We are looking at this 1929 essay by Virginia Woolf titled A Room of One's Own. This is supposedly an extension of uh, a lecture that uh, Woolf gave in two of the women's colleges uh, in Cambridge, Newnhorn and Girton in 1928. So this essay is an extended version of that lecture which she had given. And uh, this work is considered as a milestone as far as feminist critical thought is concerned, especially from the early 20th century onwards. And many of the things that Woolf speaks about in this essay, they are considered very radical given the time frame uh, during which she was uh, composing this. And she was also writing at a time when women's writing had not really begun to flourish. And here she looks at the material conditions, the uh, non-literary conditions which are also important to uh, facilitate the writing of literature and she looks at the um, many socio-historical elements which have also become very determinant in promoting women's literature or not allowing women's literature to flourish the same way that uh, men's writing had been flourishing. So she tries to locate this entire question within the historical framework but in a very unconventional way altogether. She begins this essay by addressing the uh, question of she, she was originally asked to talk about women in fiction. So she begins on that note and then she moves on to discuss many things which were which had not been brought to the uh, forefront until that point of time and she brings this question of uh, why women have not been able to write or what are the conditions that are necessary to facilitate women's writing that sort of a question had not been addressed before and she brings that question into the forefront and encourages other writers and thinkers and critics to uh, engage with it in, in, a, in a very uh, upfront manner. So uh, this uh, essay is divided into uh, five different parts and she talks about these uh, concepts that she is trying to articulate within different contexts. She gives some uh, imaginary situations, she gives some hypothetical situations and then she places her arguments and her discussions within those contexts. So this is how the essay begins. But you may say we asked you to speak about women in fiction. What has that got to do with a room of one's own? She is trying to justify this title, a room of one's own, when she had been asked to speak particularly about women and fiction. I will try to explain. When you asked me to speak about women and fiction, I sat down on the banks of a river and began to wonder what the words meant. They might mean simply a few remarks about Fanny Burney, a few more about Jane Austen. She is trying to list out the Stella writers who had left a mark in the field which could be considered as women's writing, women who had written exemplary fiction, a tribute to the Brontes, a sketch of uh, Howard Parsonage under snow, some witticisms if possible about Miss Mitford, a respectful allusion to George Eliot, a reference to Mrs. Gaskell and one would have done. So when one begins to sit and uh, sit down and think about women and fiction, there are of course a uh, set of names that come to your mind. But Wolf wants to tell us that it is not entirely about that. But at second sight the word seemed not so simple. The title women in fiction might mean and you may have meant it to mean women and what they are like or it might mean women and the fiction that they write. It is not just about picking, flagging the individuals who had the women who had written fiction. Or it might mean women and the fiction that is written about them. Or it might mean that somehow all three are inextricably mixed together and you want me to consider them in that light. So it is not a simple equation when one begins to talk about women and fiction. It could be about the kind of fiction that women write or could be the kind of fiction within which women are written about. And here Wolf tells us that she wants to look at all of these things in tandem when she is talking about women and fiction, which is why this title, this very interesting and very esoteric kind of title, A Room of One's Own. But when I began to consider the subject in this last way, which seemed the most interesting, I soon saw that it had one fatal drawback. I should never be able to come to a conclusion. I should never be able to fulfill what is I understand the first duty of a lecturer to hand you after an hour's discourse a nugget of pure truth to wrap up between the pages of your notebooks and keep on the mantelpiece forever. So this is not a discussion to which she has solutions. It is not a well uh, laid out set of arguments and set of solutions that she is possibly able to hand out and that she says is perhaps the limitation of this talk that she is about to uh, deliver, the limitation of this essay that she is about to uh, write. And by in saying this, she is also uh, inviting the participation of the 
readers of her audience and saying that this is a question perhaps we collectively need to engage with. It's not that she is standing in this uh, privileged position in order to give solutions and uh, give uh, put forward uh, worthy arguments in favor of or uh, solutions in favor of the questions and the concerns that she is raising. But on the other hand, this is more like a discussion. This is more like a, uh, a participatory discussion that she uh, wants to have. All I could do was to offer you an opinion about one minor point. Yeah? So you see the modesty with which she is approaching this subject and the, the hesitation with which she is approaching the subject. And uh, as an aside, it would be useful to also recall that it is said that after having given these uh, lectures in these two uh, colleges, in these two women's colleges, Wolf wasn't entirely happy. She thought that the, uh, the, the lecture did not go down really well. And then some of her friends were even surprised that she chose to write an extensive uh, essay on this topic and chose to publish an extended version. But this also tells us that this is something that uh, Wolf herself had been struggling with. And that's a minor point that she tries to make. But we really begin to understand towards the end of this essay that it is not really a minor point. It is all about focusing and highlighting the various conditions which should come together perhaps in order to allow women to write, in order to facilitate women's writing, in order to allow them, in order to make them uh, visible in the forefront. So this is the opinion that she offers. A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. And that, as you will see, leaves a great problem of the true nature of woman and the true nature of fiction unsolved. So we find that she has moved very radically away from literature, from literary concerns, from fiction, and she is addressing a real economic and social condition. What is a, what's the point that she is trying to make, which she also says it's her opinion? A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. It talks about the material conditions. It talks about the uh, financial support that she uh, should possibly get. It talks about the conducive ambience, the conducive atmosphere which is provided within the domestic space, a room of one's own and money if she is to write fiction. I have shirked the duty of coming to a conclusion upon these two questions, women and fiction remain, so far as I am concerned, unsolved problems. But in order to make some amends, I am going to do what I can to show you how I arrived at this opinion about the room and the money. So we find that a lecture which is supposedly on women in fiction, it has moved away to room and the money. And Virginia Woolf is about to tell us how this equation fits, how this is not really a departure, but this is a part of the main discussion that she is about to have on women and fiction, that it is impossible to have a discussion on women and fiction unless we talk about the room and the money which facilitates this production, uh, or the room and the money which would also empower these women. I am going to develop in your presence as fully and freely as I can the train of thought which led me to think this. So she, as pointed out at the outset, Virginia Woolf is inviting her audience to participate in this train of thought. Perhaps if I lay bare the ideas, the prejudices the, that lie behind the statement, you will find that they have some bearing upon women and some upon fiction at any, at any rate when a subject is highly controversial and any question about sex is that one cannot hope to tell the truth. One can only show how one came to hold whatever opinion one does hold. Look at the way in which here the opinion and in the individual arguments are being privileged vis-a-vis -vis truth. Truth and rationality which are considered as the thing the things which validate. We find that Virginia Woolf is completely debunking them and saying that in such matters, in such controversial matters, in such matters on which we one cannot perhaps reach a consensus, you can only have an opinion and give a logical uh, train of thought to how you arrived at that opinion. It is not possible to talk about the truth, quote unquote, the truth, the fact as it has been happening. One can only give one's audience the chance of drawing their own conclusions as they observe the limitations, the prejudices, the idiosyncrasies of the speaker. She is exposing herself over here. She is laying herself bare over here saying that it is not that she has the truth or the solutions to offer before this audience, but on the other hand, she is confident that she is able to unpack the seemingly neat way in which women and fiction have been seen together and to show to the audience that how 
there are many underlying things for instance the room the money which are involved in this uh, facilitation of the production and also uh, more importantly she is encouraging the audience to arrive at their own conclusions which is why she states uh, she states right at the outset of this uh, essay that it's an opinion that she has to offer on this matter it's not a conclusive solution and it is not the truth for that matter fiction here is likely to contain more truth than fact and she's looking at fiction also in a very different way altogether Therefore, I propose making use of all the liberties and licenses of a novelist to tell you the story of the two days that preceded my coming here. How, bowed down by the weight of the subject which you have laid upon my shoulders, I pondered it and make, made it work in and out of my daily life. I need not say that I am about to describe has no existence. Oxbridge is an invention. So here, it's a hybrid term as we know. Oxford and Cambridge and those are traditionally seen as uh, very male, very elite universities and she is contrasting Oxbridge which she says is an invention but we know that it is not really so and so is Fernham. Fernham is a women's college that she hypothetically invents to uh, contrast with Oxbridge. I is only a convenient term for somebody who has no real being. So there is a hypothetical situation she presents over here, but it's also very, very experiential. And this has been presented in such dramatic fictional ways. Lies will flow from my lips, but there may perhaps be some truth mixed up with them. So this is the kind of elements that uh, she takes. This is the uh, this is how she is uh, also bailing out of this sit her herself out of this situation by saying, "I'm only a." fictional writer and do not expect any amount of truth in it but at the same time you may find some uh, vestiges of truth in this and that might also help you to arrive to certain kinds of conclusions. It is for you to speak out this truth and to decide whether any part of it is worth keeping. If not, you will of course throw the whole of it into the waste paper basket and forget all about it. So this is the modesty and confidence uh, to uh, ironical things that come together with which she is addressing the audience. Here then was I, call me Mary Beaton, Mary Seaton, Mary Carmichael or by any name you please. The name really does not matter. It is about this symbol. It is about this identity, this female identity that she is carrying. It could be Mary anyone. It is not a matter of any importance. So this Mary, this fictional character, this imaginary character is sitting on the banks of a river a week or two ago in fine October weather lost in thought. That caller I have spoken of, women and fiction, the need of coming to some conclusion on a subject that raises all sorts of prejudices and passions, bowed my head to the ground. To the right and left bushes of some sort, golden and crimson, glowed with the colour, even it seemed burnt with the heat, on f heat of fire. The writer in her also comes out over here. You can read through this uh, description, this very interesting description entirely on your own. And then she gets on to the crux of the matter. It was thus that I found myself walking with extreme rapidity across a grass plot. Instantly a man's figure rose to intercept me. Nor did I at first understand that the gesticulations of a curious looking object in a cutaway coat and evening shirt were aimed at me. His face expressed horror and indignation. So she is being encountered over, uh, over here. She is being intercepted over here. Mind you, she is trying to have these intellectual thoughts and discussions about the lecture that she has to deliver very soon. Instinct rather than reason came to my help. He was a beetle. I was a woman. This was the turf. There was a path. Only the fellows and scholars are allowed here. The gravel is the place for me. Such thoughts were the work of a moment. As I gained, regained the path, the arms of the beetle sank. His face assumed uh, its usual repose. And though turf is better walking than gravel, no very great harm was done. The only charge I could bring against the fellows and scholars of whatever the college might happen to be was that in protection of their turf, which has been rolled for 300 years in succession, they had sent my little fish into hiding. So this is what 300 year uh, old legacy of this particular university does to women. That's a point that uh, Wolf is trying to highlight over here. What idea it had been that had sent me to, set me so audaciously trespassing, I could not now remember. So she's seen as a trespasser over there regardless of the kind of scholarship that he, she possesses, regardless of the kind of intellectual engagements that she is capable of having. The spirit of peace descended like a cloud from heaven, for if the spirit of peace dwells anywhere, it's in the courts and quadrangles of Oxbridge on a fine October morning. She's being very sarcastic over here. This is how 
these portals have been traditionally seen as they are also uh, she reminds us they are very male and they are very elite and it is not an easy task for, an, for a woman to gain admission not into those uh, um, portals but not in those uh, uh, premises either one cannot uh, let oneself go in those premises either if one does not happen to be the in the right category in this case male. Strolling through those colleges past those ancient halls, the roughness of the present seemed smoothed away. The body seemed contained in a miraculous glass cabinet through which no sound could penetrate and the mind, free from any contact with facts, was at liberty to settle upon whatever meditation was in harmony with the moment. She, was, she is giving it as these very contrasting images in order to showcase how the ways in which women have entirely been kept out of those uh, uh, spaces. And then she thinks about an old essay about revisiting Oxbridge in the long vacation brought out by brought Charles Lamb to mind. St. Charles said Thackeray putting a letter of Lamb's uh, to his forehead. So she is thinking about all the things that she has read about Oxbridge and she also realizes that it is not a place where she feels very comfortable with very contrary to the kind of things that she had been reading uh, very contrary to the kind of things that have been fed into the cultural memory about uh, Oxbridge. Indeed, among all the dead, I give you my thoughts as they came to me. So, we find that uh, another interesting point over here, just as a way she had been using the stream of conscious technique in her fiction, we find that in this uh, uh, lecture and in this essay also, she is giving uh, the audience her thoughts as they came to her. It is very uh, unprocessed in a certain way if you could say that and it is also very fresh and uh, it also invites the reader and the audience to be participants to this thought formation to this uh, uh, journey towards to this train of thought towards a certain possible conclusion. Lamb is one of the most congenial one to whom I would one would have liked to say tell me then how you wrote your essays for his essays are superior even to Max Beerholm's. I thought with all the perfection because of that wild flash of imagination. Lamb then came to Oxbridge perhaps a hundred years ago. Certainly he wrote an essay, the name escapes me, about the manuscript of one of Milton's poems which he saw here. It was Lycidas perhaps and she is thinking about all the things that she has read about Oxbridge through the male writers, through their perceptions and through their experiences. And she thinks about Charles Lamb who could write an essay on Milton's Lycidas because he had access to the manuscripts in the library and then she thinks she should perhaps make her way to this same library which had perhaps acted as a muse for um, this congenial writer Lamb and what awaits her. But here I was actually at the door which leads into the library itself and this is an experiential thing and uh, by saying at the outset of this narration that this is also fictional. Wolf we find over here is trying to dramatize this entire situation. The drama is accentuated over here. So, here is Virginia Wolf who is trying to think about this topic uh, women and fiction on which she is supposed to give a lecture in, uh, in, uh, in a couple of these uh, uh, women's colleges in uh, Cambridge and she thinks about Charles Lamb who wrote about Lycidas 100 years ago and how he had access the manuscript uh, Milton's manuscript in the library and she thinks perhaps she could make use of some of this inspiration herself and she tries to make her find her way into the library. Here I was actually at the door which leads into the library itself. I must have opened it for instantly there issued like a guardian angel barring the way with a flutter of black gown instead of white wings a deprecating silvery kindly gentleman who regretted in a low voice as he waved me back that ladies are only admitted to the library if accompanied by a fellow of the college or furnished with a letter of introduction. So, this is 1929 and this is what she faces when she is trying to she or any woman whom she chooses to call as Mary over here any woman would face if she tries to enter the library the university library for any academic or intellectual intervention and the as per the rule women can enter only if they are accompanied by a fellow of the college or furnished with a letter of introduction. She has neither and obviously she is denied entry 
to these hallowed portals, to these spaces which had proved as, which had existed as inspiration to many women writers. So this perhaps brings us back to the original point that she was talking about, women and fiction. It's not entirely about women, it's not entirely about fiction, it's also about the many other conditions which facilitate, which facilitate this process. And in certain ways, it's also about the kind of accesses which spaces allow for women. That a famous library has been cursed by a woman is a matter of complete indifference to a famous library, venerable and calm, with all its treasures safe locked within its breast. It sleeps complacently and, well, so far as I am concerned, so sleep forever. Never will I wake those echoes. Never will I ask for that hospitality again. I vowed as I descended the steps in anger. Yeah. So she has been denied access and now she is leaving though that space in complete resentment. Then she finds her way to the chapel and decides not to enter. I had no wish to enter had I the right and this time the, vir the verger might have stopped me demanding perhaps my bapt baptismal certificate or a letter of introduction from the dean. And then she also talks about the memories, the stories of old deans and old dons and she encounters a certain old professor over here. Before I had summoned up the courage to whistle, it used to be said that at the sound of a whistle, old professor instantly broke into a gallop the venerable congregation had got in sight. The outside of the chapel remained yeah? and she is thinking of drawing the attention of this old professor whom she encounters over there and she has this very interesting discussion with this old professor and all of this is uh, partly imaginary as well. She talks about the money which has been flowing into Oxbridge. Yeah. It was then the age of faith and money was poured liberally to set these stones on a deep foundation and when the stones were raised, still more money was poured in from the coffers of kings and queens and great nobles to ensure that hymns should be sung here and scholars taught, lands, lands were granted, tithes were paid. And when the age of faith was over and the age of reason had come, still the same flow of gold and silver went on. So whether it was a theocratical society or after the uh, uh, coming of age of enlightenment and the era of rationalism and reason, she finds that money continued to pour into these spaces and they continue to be very male and very elite and regardless of what the socio-political framework was, it does not seem to have changed anything as far as a woman like her was concerned, as far as Mary, this imaginary uh, character who was trying to enter the library or the chapel was concerned. Hence, the libraries and laboratories, the observatories, the splendid equipment of costly and delicate instruments which now stands on glass shelves where centuries ago the grasses waved and the swine rootled. Certainly, as I strolled round the court, the foundation of gold and silver seemed deep enough. The pavement laid solidly over the wild grasses. She says it was impossible not to reflect. The reflection, whatever it may have been, was cut short and then it's, fine, it's time for her uh, it's time for her to find her way to Luncheon. Then she has this very curious thought about how novelists have a way of making us believe that luncheon parties are invariably memorable for something very witty that was said or something very wise that was done. She's obviously talking about the many descriptions and the many memoirs and the many fiction that has been written by men where luncheon parties are described only for the company and then she says seldom spare a word for what was eaten. It's part of the novelist convention not to mention soup and salmon and ducklings as if soup and salmon and ducklings were of no importance whatsoever as if nobody ever smoked a cigar or drank a glass of wine. Here however I shall take the liberty to defy that convention and tell you that the lunch on this occasion began with souls sunk in deep sh uh, dish over which the college cook had spread a counterpane of the whitest cream save that it was branded here and there with brown spots like the spots on the flanks of a dough. So this description is very very interesting and this is also a part of the thought that she is uh, sharing with her audience with her readers. This is also a part of the train of uh, thought in, in which she wants her uh, audience and her readers to be um, partakers in. And we find that this, this description by itself is extremely interesting because she is talking about the kind of fiction that women could have written, that women possibly uh, should have to write, contrary to the many male narratives which are in vogue, contrary to the male, many male narratives within which our narratives and stories are also fraught. So whether you take the case of Charles Lamb who could access the library and then uh, get inspired by 
the manuscript of uh, uh, Lycidas or whether that is the men who regularly have such luncheons and find company more interesting, the, the witness of it more interesting than the food itself. Virginia Woolf says that women are always left out of these narratives because they do not have an experiential narration of these uh, uh, events. They are not participants in this. They are only things are often told to them and when women figure in over there, they are only written about, they are only narrated. She will very shortly come to that point as well. And her thought goes along these lines, reflecting upon the experience that she has over there. Then she takes, then she says, but what was lacking? Something seemed different. What was different? I asked myself listening to the talk. And to answer that question, I had to think myself out of the room because that room is clearly not the place where she entirely belongs because she, her, she has been, she and her likes, whether it's Virginia Woolf or Mary Seaton or any of the women writers that she mentions at the outset, they all have been left out of those conversations and those spaces. Back into the past before the war ended and to set before my eyes the model of another luncheon party held in these rooms, not very far distant from these but different everything was different meanwhile the talk went on among the guests who were many and young some of this sex some of that it went on swimmingly it went on agreeably freely amusingly and as i went on to set it against the background of the other talk and as i matched the two together I had no doubt that one was a descendant the legitimate heir of the other nothing was changed nothing was different save only here i listened with all my ears not to entirely what was being said, but to the murmur or current behind it. Yes, that was it. The change was there. Yeah. So the only change was there. The change was that she was there witnessing to witnessing these conversations, not really being a part of that, but trying to process that in her own terms. And now she is thinking about Tennyson, the kind of thoughts that a poet like Tennyson uh, would have had perhaps and this is what Tennyson is uh, uh, singing she says there has fallen a splendid tear from the passion flower at the gate she's coming my dove my dear she's coming my life my fate the red rose cries she's near she's near and the white rose weeps she's late the larkspur listens I hear I hear and the lily whispers I wait and on the contrary she's trying to also think about what could be the songs what was that that was that what men hummed at luncheon parties before the war? And the women, she's trying to think about the kind of thoughts that a woman could have had. My heart is like a singing bird whose nest is in a watered shoot. My heart is like an apple tree whose boughs are bent with thick set fruit. She is clearly showing us a difference between the way men write and the way women write and the kind of thoughts and the kind of conversations that would be had on an everyday basis. The everydayness which has been overlooked quite spectacularly well has been brought back into discussion is uh, being highlighted over here in this uh, uh, essay of Virginia Woolf. And she's again wondering, was that what women harmed at luncheon parties before the war? There was something so ludicrous in thinking of people humming such things even under their breath at luncheon parties before the war that I burst out laughing and had to explain my laughter by pointing at the Manx cat who did look a little absurd, poor beast, without a tail in the middle of the lawn. And here she is talking about the unreal way in which fiction had been functioning as far as women's stories were concerned. She finds it even ludicrous to think about the many things that uh, have been written about women because she finds herself in the middle of certain experiences about which she has read many times and she finds that her belonging in this setting is entirely the same. She has a different tale to tell altogether which obviously has not been recorded so far. This brings us back to her original question about women and fiction, about the conditions which have to be there in the first place in order to help women to write the kind of fiction that they would want to. And now she's contrasting this with the experience that she's about to have as at, at Fernham. So from Oxbridge, she's moving to Fernham and she's giving a very brilliant contrast between these two experiences. At Fernham, she realizes everything is less fancy. We'll very quickly go to that section where she talks about uh, food. Here was my soup. Dinner was being served in the great dining hall. Far from being spring, it was in fact an evening in October. Everybody was assembled in the big dining room. Dinner was ready. Here was the soup. It was a plain gravy soup. There was nothing to stir the fancy in that. So compared to the very fanciful experience into which she didn't really belong, the very fanciful experience that she had at Oxbridge, she finds that at Fernham, 
there's hardly anything fanciful. Plate was plain. Next came beef with its attendant greens and potatoes, a homely trinity suggesting the rums of cattle in a muddy market. So things are very plain, very ordinary, nothing fanciful at Fernham. And now she is trying to have this very unconventional thought about the money which pours into Fernham. Compared to the luxury that you find at Oxbridge, she realizes that there's hardly anything in uh, Fernham and she begins to wonder, this college where we are now sitting, what lies beneath its gallant red brick and the wild unkempt grasses of the garden? And she is wondering about the many meetings, the circulars, which were also part of these uh, uh, the, uh, which were also part of these uh, institutional frameworks and she begins to wonder and she's also being told uh, and, and uh, this is also part of the history that she ducks uh, that she digs up and it was only after long struggle and with the utmost difficulty that they got 30,000 pounds together this is in stark contrast to the money which the, the wealth that continued to pour uh, continued to pour into Oxbridge before the war after the war during the theocratical uh, during the theocracy and after enlightenment and from the time of its inception we find that wealth has always poured into Oxbridge making it look very fancy very um, inviting but on the other hand it's only with much uh, struggle only with a lot of struggle that at Fernham they managed to raise even the minimal amount which is needed for their uh, maintenance and subsistence. At the thought of all these women working year after year and finding it hard to get 2000 pounds together and as much as they could do to get 30,000 pounds we burst out in scorn at the reprehens rep reprehensible poverty of our sex what had our mothers been doing that they had no wealth to leave us? So she is pondering about the historical, sociopolitical, financial, material conditions which had led to this relative poverty at Fernham. And she wonders what were our mothers doing that they didn't have enough wealth to leave behind. Why is it that all wealth was concentrated on Oxbridge where the male and the elite went to? Uh, college and she comes back to this fictional identity that she had coined at the beginning Mary Mary's mother may have been a wastrel in her spare time she had 13 children by a minister of the church but if so her gay and dissipated life had left too few traces of its pleasures on her face she was a homely body an old lady in a plaid shawl which was fastened by a large cameo and she sat in a basket chair encouraging a spaniel to look at the camera with the amused yet strained expression of one who is sure that the dog will move directly the bulb is pressed now if she had gone into business yeah so here's again another imaginary contrast which is at work over here mary's mother she had been busy racing, raising 13 children and she was a wife of a, a minister of the church and what could she possibly have done and this time and energy which she had invested into raising 13 children by leading a near poor life as the wife of a minister in church that has not been recorded at all we find that there is no way in which money could be generated from that there is no way in which wealth could be generated from that she's also in certain ways asking us larger questions about this labor wasted whereas as uh, when in, in in terms of the time and effort that women had been putting into their domestic chores now she's giving us another rosy picture another possibility which is almost imaginary hypothetical here now if she had gone into business, had become a manufacturer of artificial silk or a magnet on the stock exchange. If she had left two or three hundred thousand pounds to Fernham, we could have been sitting at our ease tonight and the subject of her talk might have been archaeology, botany, anthropology, physics, the nature of the atom, mathematics, astronomy, relativity, geography. This is very, very powerful. Virginia Woolf is trying to tell us that now we cannot talk about these lofty things. We cannot talk about all these fancy things because we are still stuck with the bare minimum of not being able to have enough money, not being able to afford one's own room and space in order to start writing, in order to start articulating. So the contrast that she provides, presence between Oxbridge and Fernham, it begins to assume a greater relevance. It begins to talk about a larger story which has always been uh, swept under the carpet. Making a fortune and bearing 
13 children. No human being could stand it. Consider the facts we said. First, there are nine months before the baby is born, then the baby is born, then there are three or four months spent in feeding the baby, and after the baby is fed, there are certainly five years spent in playing with the baby. You cannot, it seems, let children run about the streets. So she is also talking about these very practical considerations, which would also come in the way of uh, a woman who wants to be a writer in the way of a woman who wants to be a professional. She's talking about these many domestic social conditionings which are also at work when it comes to the profession of a woman, to the uh, career advancement of a woman. And this, given that this was articulated in early 20th century, 1928 and in 1929, this was a very radical feminist thing to say at that point of time, to draw attention to the immediate social material conditions which also plays a big role in making men or women visible in their respective fields, in their chosen uh, areas of expertise. At the end of this first uh, uh, section, she continues to think about money. I pondered why it was that Mrs. Seaton had no money to leave us and what effect poverty has on the mind and what effect wealth has on the mind. And I thought of the pure old gentlemen I had seen that morning with tufts of fur upon their shoulders and I remembered how if one whistled one of them ran and I thought of the organ booming in the chapel and the shut doors of the library and I thought how unpleasant it is to be locked out. This is a woman's experience in Oxford as she is narrating it and she is linking this up to a larger historical problem of women being poor in spite of them contributing much to the family, much to the societies and nations that they are part of, contributing much in terms of child rearing, contributing much in terms of uh, caregiving. She says that there is a certain poverty within which they are historically stuck because of which the many Marys and the many Virginia Woolves are also denied entry, are also denied these accesses which come perhaps quite naturally, quite automatically to the male counterparts. And I thought how it is worse perhaps to be locked in and thinking of the safety and prosperity of one sex and of the poverty and insecurity of the other and the effect of tradition of the lack of tradition upon the mind of a writer. I thought at last it was time to roll up the crumpled skin of the day with its arguments and its impressions and its anger and its laughter and cast it into the hedge. The pointlessness of it comes home to her towards the end of the first section. The disparity which is at work in institutional ways, which is at work in very spectacular visible ways and the desperateness that uh, within which she is uh, um, faced to uh, sink into, that strikes her very hard towards the end of this. One seemed alone with an inscrutable society. All human beings are laid asleep. No one seems to be disturbed by this at all uh, except for her and this imaginary character Mary Seaton. Nobody seems stirring in the streets of Oxford. Even the door of the hotel sprang open at the touch of an invisible hand. Not a boots was sitting up to light me bed. It was so late. So she thinks about, she begins talking about women in fiction and then she shares with us a certain conclusion on which she has already arrived that one needs money and a room of one's own uh, in order to write. That's how women in fiction should be talked about. Then she talks, shares her experiences in Oxbridge and the contrasting experience that she has as a woman in Fernham. Then she links it up to poverty and she links it up to how women have been historically unable to uh, send funds for the sake of their daughters and how all these preserves, these universities have ended up as being very male elite preserves. So this is how she ends the first chapter. It's very radical but it, there's also a certain kind of uh, uh, gloominess that we begin to find towards the end of this uh, uh, first section. In the succeeding sections we will find that it becomes more and more radical and we find the this opening up, this uh, unraveling, this unpacking getting more and more interesting and more challenging as well. So I leave you with this. I encourage you to take a look at the next section before we meet for the next uh, uh, session. I uh, thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.